Regrettably, I'm recording. <laughs> <laughs> right, can you hear and see Richard okay? Yeah, this one of the unfortunate things in life, I can. <laughs> <laughs> Ricardo, hello. Good to see you. Hello, sir. Good to see you, mate. Very good you're, to see you. Uh, very it, it would be great if you could maybe move back just a little bit from the camera, Sam, just so we can get your whole face. All my women kept telling me this. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be great if you just could move back a bit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Ready to roll then. Great. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the pleasure of having Mr. Sam Vaknin back with us again today. And uh, we're going to be talking about what happens when people cannot recover from a narcissistically abusive relationship and they get stuck in a grieving cycle and cannot escape from it. Sam, thank you for joining us again. Thank you for having me, Richard. My, uh, my pleasure and your honor. Now, <laughs> <laughs> now I've, made a, I've made a previous video. It's on my YouTube channel. It's called The it, Narc yes. Narcissist as a Grieving Infant. Mm -hmm. where I expound upon the new concept, the new clinical entity, new clinical mm -hmm. concept of prolonged grief disorder, yeah. uh, previously known as complicated grief. Yeah. So people might do well to watch that video first, where there's an introduction to the, to the concept and so on, yes. uh, so that we don't kind of rehash the same, the same material over again. Yeah, pe people definitely should watch uh, that video, uh, Narcissist is Grieving Infant. There's elements of that that I particularly want to ask you about, just because I'm quite selfish and I want to get some free therapy from this interview as well, because I saw some what, of myself. Goes there. without saying. Goes without yeah. saying. <laughs> I'm not doing this for other people. It's my of aggrandizement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was, um, yeah, there's there's elements of the, of the mechanics of this uh, prolonged grieving syndrome that I definitely saw. Uh, myself in and I'm sure a lot of people watching will as well that would be very pertinent to because so much of what we're talking about the people who follow us they're typically the victims of narcissists they've been in narcissistic abusive relationships they don't want to study narcissism but they can't move on so understanding this syndrome I believe could be a real key it could be a real watermark moment in the healing from narcissistic abuse uh, field and you will be blazing the trail on this one well i'm used to it you know <laughs> so what's yeah, I the uh, i was just going to ask you like the broad strokes um what is this syndrome you said it's it's now becoming clinically recognized yes the syndrome will be included in the text revision of the diagnostic and statistical manual edition five which we publish in a year or two okay. so it's going to become official it okay. used to be called complicated grief it's now called officially uh, prolonged grief uh, disorder or uh, PGD for short and it is the inability to move on once a grieving or mourning process had started. Now Elizabeth Kubler-Ross who was a Swiss-American uh, psychologist in 1968-1969 had described the five stages of grief which have now been amended to six by the way. Yeah. So there are six stages of grief and what happens is people get stuck in one of these stages. So there's mm -hmm. anger, there's denial, yeah. depression, acceptance, et cetera, et cetera. People get stuck in one of these stages and they can't, can't seem to move on. They keep ruminating, they keep obsessing, they deny the, the loss, uh, loss of a loved one, loss of a workplace, because prolonged grief doesn't have to be about a relationship. It can yeah. be about losing your, your job. It can be about moving to another place, relocating. Yeah. You could grieve your, your hometown. Um, yes. you, you know, it's grief, grief that is fossilized, ossified, and never goes away. And this nagging, knowing feeling that the loss is there to stay, it's, it's all consuming, it's all pervasive, and it's never, ever uh, going to let you go. Now, this, is, this goes together with depression, with anxiety, with dysfunctions of a variety of sorts, mental and physical, we are all, we all, I think all of us um, had experienced at least one episode of prolonged grief. The technical definition is grief that lasts longer than one year. And I think, I don't know any human being um, and narcissist who did not go through a, a prolonged grief uh, episode. So I think it's so, episodic. So just to be super clear um 
for for those of us who 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 don't have intelligence that operates <laughs> at high speed, there is normal grief. There's a, a normal standardized grief. Most of us would have experienced a probably at some point in our lives, we probably have grieved healthily and, yeah. and, and effectively. But what you're saying is many of us will also have had an episode where we did not grieve in a, we didn't, if it was the digestive system, we didn't digest it quickly. It actually right. lingered. And, and the, the, the barrier point clinically would be 12 months or more. You're yes. now suffering with, with prolonged grief. Right. It's arbitrary, of course. I mean, what's the difference between 12 months and 11 months? It's arbitrary. You have, to put, you have to put a point somewhere. But it simply means, I think, a feeling that you are as grieving now as you were 12 months ago. It's the same intensity, same, per, same ubiquity, same intrusiveness, intrusive thoughts, intrusive sadness, paralyzing um dysregulated overwhelming emotion and negative affectivity negative emotions um a sadness that is overpowering and colors everything you know that, that, that actually everything you do is imbued with sadness and depression and um a feeling that you don't want to go on with life suicidal ideation anxiety etc cetera, etc cetera, which are as as mighty as powerful as intense as they were 12 months ago. No, that's not normal. It doesn't fade. It doesn't fade away. So subjectively to the, to the client, to the human being experiencing this, it was almost as though no time had passed at all. As exactly, though it as just though it happened, had happened yesterday. yesterday. Yeah. As though it had happened yesterday, every single day, day in and day out, night in and night out, because there are intrusive dreams and, you know, it's, it, it colors everything. It becomes gradually uh, an ideology, an organizing principle. It, it helps you make sense of the world, make sense of yourself. People ask you, why are you like that? Well, I'm grieving, you know, I'm sad. I lost my son and, and I can't recover. But hey, you lost your son like five years ago. Yeah, but I still can't recover, you know? And so that explains why I'm like that, why I'm dysfunctional, why I don't date, why do I, I don't go out, why I'm a hermit, why I'm, I, I don't consume entertainment or culture why I'm, so it becomes an organizing explanatory principle in which is the danger because it then um makes sense of your life and then it's very difficult to let go that, that, that sounds actually dangerous it sounds very yes. very dangerous so yes. i've heard of post-traumatic embitterment syndrome this would be an explanation for why and how and the mechanics for that and then i i've only just read about this recently in the book the coddling of the american mind a concept called looping where looping. because you think you are weak you become weak because you think you are sick you become sick so it could make you very mentally unwell in the end and really restrict your options in life it's gratifying when you have a single fact or a single event or a single thing that seems to explain everything why you behave the way you do why you're feeling the way you do, why people relate to you the way they do. Like it's a single thing that suddenly makes sense of the world, of yourself, of your place in the world, of your interactions. It's very seductive. It's enticing. This is the power of religion. God as a single principle explains everything. You know, you don't need science. You don't need anything. It's, there's God. So this grief becomes a pivot, becomes the axis around which your life revolves. And you revert to it all the time when you're trying to make sense of your life. And it works. It simply works. Because why am I sad? Well, because of my loss. Why am I not dating? Well, because of my loss. Why am I not pursuing my academic degree? Well, because of my loss. I mean, everything suddenly makes total sense. And it's also an alibi, of course. It's an alibi for in, in action and, and um, kind of... Uh, <laughs> You know what I mean? I mean, it's not well, victim blaming, but it's it is. No, well, well, well. I, I saw, I saw you were you were reluctant to go there, but but I will. The it could be an alibi for abuse. I mean, this resonates with narratives that I've heard from people with borderline personality disorder and that martyrdom complex because of this event. Yes, of course, I am abusing you, but it's not me. It's the thing. It's the it's that thing that's making me do this to you. So you must forgive me. Where we were both preceded by Theodore Millen, and Theodore Millen in 2000, 
when we were both uh, sperms. Theodor Millen, uh, well, you were. Theodor Millen <laughs> described um, uh, what he called the morally righteous uh, abuser, a morally righteous narcissist. A narcissist whose grandiosity, the locus of his grandiosity, is the moral high ground. I'm a super moral person. And so it, it's self, self righteous, sanctimonious, and justifies abusive conduct, abusive behavior. So, yeah, grieving could give, could legitimate be behaviors which are essentially dysregulated, hurtful, abusive, antisocial, or asocial, because, hey, you owe me. I'm, I mean, you, you should cut, give me some slack because cut me some slack because I'm grieving. Can't you see I'm grieving? I mean, you shouldn't judge me. I'm grieving. I know that uh, some people on the internet, you may not be aware of this, Sam, but they don't hear very clearly when we say words. <laughs> so I just, I just, <laughs> I just want to be clear. We're not saying that everybody who grieves ends up being abusive. What we actually said was, some people who are stuck in this grieving cycle, it might contribute to some some pretty selfish, pretty abusive and exploitative patterns of behavior. And and I I said it was what I would recognize with borderline personality disorder types that my pain is special, my pain is unique, my trauma is unique. So therefore, and you you cited the grandiose hyper moral person. We're not saying people who grieve are, are abusive, but no, I that. Think I think, on, a tiny, a tiny, I think a tiny fraction tiny. of okay. people who experience prolonged grief gravitate yeah. to that kind of behavior. I, really a tiny fraction. I, I don't think a majority uh, will do. And would we go as far as to say they probably already had latent narcissism before yeah. the trauma anyway? Yeah, the grief legitimizes, as I said. It's, it's just an explanatory principle. It's a, an excuse. It's an excuse. It's self-justifying. So, like, why am I behaving this way? Why am I misbehaving? Why? Because I'm grieving, or because I'm a victim. And you have these victimhood movements, which are essentially self-aggrandizing and self-moralizing and such, and sanctimonious and self-righteous. Uh, we are we are angels. Our abusers are the devil. You know, you have empaths and super empaths and supernova empaths and super galactic nova empaths, and I don't know what else would be invented. These are sick pathological. Uh, behaviors and, and self-justification. But I think not to not to veer too much off course, which you and I have a tendency to do. Um, <laughs> I, I just I just wanted to say, because you, you cited the, the movements and the groups, and it's just interesting to me, just a side note, they usually rely on some historical grievance, which would be grief. It's a collective grief because of the thing that happened in 1502. We have to commit a genocide against a specified group in 2021. Yeah, yeah okay. there is entrenched, entrenched grief reactions on a collective level, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I would cite my own, my own nation. I'm, I'm a Jew. Yeah. I know it comes as a shock to many of you, but I'm a Jew. And I can prove it, but I won't do it on camera because then my channel will be deleted. <laughs> and so um, the Jews have this thing. I'm sorry mm -hmm. to say it might be construed as an anti-Semitic uh, kind of comment, but it's not. Yeah. Um, following the Holocaust, especially, there's an entrenched grief reaction, which mm -hmm. is memorable. I mean, there's a memorial day every year for mm -hmm. collective grief, which is ho Holocaust. Day of the Holocaust yeah. every year yeah. in April. Mm -hmm. And it's a day of collective grief. Mm -hmm. And it's not only grieving, but it's the, um, there is a, a kind of linkage between the grief and the and the wrong done to the to the Jewish people. No question about it. I'm not a Holocaust denier. This this horrible thing, atrocity had happened fully, probably underestimated, mind you. So but there's, there's a kind of linkage between this and a series of assertions about rights and commensurate obligations of other people. Yes. So when grief becomes actionable, that's mm. the problem. When you weaponize grief, when you weaponize it, that's well, the problem. They, they even have uh, grievance studies. If you have a grievance, that must be etymologically related to yeah. grief. And I'm very concerned with that because, again, not to veer off too much, um, I'm not aware of a his, of a, an atrocity historically that wasn't rooted in a grievance, even with the Holocaust. You know, that was rooted in a historical grievance. The Nazis did that in response to something that had happened historically, they felt. So it's, um, 
well, we sort of moved into the, from abuse individually to potential abuse collectively, but this is, we have to have this conversation. It's a very important conversation outside of narcissistic abuse in the realm of culture and politics and everything, I, agree. I think. I agree. I would like though to make a, a specific comment about narcissistic abuse. Mm. Um, one of the main reasons I coined the phrase in 95, because there was no need to coin the phrase, mind you. I mean, mm. Think about it for a minute, consider it for a minute. Why did we have to have a specialized subtype of abuse? Why not just say abuse? <laughs> Mm. Because narcissistic abuse is different. And one of the things that narcissistic abu abuse engenders is indeed prolonged grief. And the narcissist does this in a very pernicious way. Now, people have this image of the narcissist as the conniving, scheming scoundrel, um, steeped in penumbral, you know, machinations. And so it's not, it's a predator. It's totally, the behaviors are totally automated. They're totally unconscious. They're totally, they come, they flow naturally. The, the narcissist does what I'm about to describe the way a virus infects a cell. It's, uh, there's no thinking involved. There's no skimming, there's no conniving, there's no cunning, there's not nothing there. I mean, people, people tend to glamorize the narcissist actually by rendering the narcissist some kind of a super villain, you know? And, and even academe, even academia is complicit in this because you have Machiavellianism. Nazis are not Machiavellian. Narcissists are a-holes. <laughs> and they do what they do because that's who they are. They're predators. The same way lions eat antelopes. What can you do? Antelopes are much cuter than lions. And yet lions eat them. That's the way it is. So narcissists engender uh, prolonged grief, I think, in, in four ways. And then I'm going to mention the ways and then, you know, we can take it from there, yes. if you wish. Yes. Is, yes. is that uh, okay uh, with you? Is that okay yeah. with you? I find it acceptable. Okay, I'm asking out of courtesy. I, 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 you know, I totally don't <laughs> I'm care. I'm totally you, indifferent you, to your yeah, answer. I, I, don't give a, I don't give a shit what you care about. <laughs> but, you know, I have to be, I have to play the game. Okay. So, thank you, Richard. Uh, <clears throat> so... <laughs> so <laughs> Mm. I love this self-disclosure. Yeah, where were I? Oh, yeah. So narcissist induces prolonged grief, I think, in, in his victim. I'm going to use his, although now we know that 50% of all narcissists are actually female. Is I that mean, clinical? Is that, is that a known thing? Yeah, the latest studies are that it's, it's half, half. It used to right. be 25, 75, but now women became half of the clinically diagnosed population, which is why I keep saying in various videos, women are becoming narcissistic mm. and then women are attacking me, but that's based on numbers. I mean, yes. the percentage of women in clinical, among clinically diagnosed populations, yes. of cluster B is exploding literally off the charts. So wow. now it's 50, 50. So now, but I'm going to use his, I'm going to yeah. use his because I'm a male chauvinist. So <laughs> there are, there are four ways the narcissist induces uh, prolonged grief. I, I'll try to be, I'll try to be brief because I'm mindful of the fact that you also have a right to speak for some oblivious reason. So, <laughs> okay. I hope people don't take this banter seriously. <laughs> oh, I hope they do, Sam. I <laughs> hope they do. I love to see their distress in the comments. They go crazy. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I think the narcissist does four things. The first thing the narcissist does it allows you to experience self-love. And for many of the victims, it is the first time they experience self-love. And what's the problem with that? Ostensibly, it's a service to humanity. But the narcissist allows you to fall in love with an image of yourself that is grandiose, unrealistic, idealized. So you fall in love with a phantasm, with a, with a fantastic figment. And the narcissist holds the key. He can, he can lock the door to the hall of mirrors at any minute. And then you won't be able to see your glamorized, idealized reflection. And you won't be able to love yourself anymore. So that's the first thing. The narcissist holds the key to a new sensation of falling in love with a perfect you, with an amazing you, with a brilliant you, etc., etc. And this grandiose image is inculcated in the love bombing and grooming uh, phases. 
Now, the second observation, now this is classic observation. Many people have said it. Um, I have said it. I have said it before many people said it. <laughs> but okay, I also said it. There's a second observation, which I think this is the first time anyone is offering, has ever offered it. I mean, it's the first time I think anyone would, has said that. It's important to say this, that it's the first time because it's highly counterintuitive. So here's the second observation. The narcissist offers you what your mother should have offered you. He offers you unconditional love. In the love bombing and grooming phase, the narcissist simulates highly effectively unconditional love. He loves you because of who you are. He tells you, you're the most amazing thing. You're the most handsome thing. You are a genius. You are stunning. You are unique. You're... The same way a mother would do with her infant, with her child. Actually, what, what's happening, the narcissist is using projective identification to induce in his intimate partner maternal emotions or maternal affects. And he does this by becoming a mother. Now, it's, it's very important to understand that narcissists never separate from their mothers. The separation individuation phase in narciss among narcissists had failed. As children, they failed to separate from mommy. They failed to become full-fledged individuals. So they remained in a state known as symbiotic fusion, which we will come to a bit later. In other words, half of every narcissist is his mother. Narcissist carries with him his, his mother, his real mother, wherever he goes. So it's easy for him to become a mother. Even if he's a male, it's easy for him to become a mother. When he interacts with the intimate partner, he becomes her mother. He gives her unconditional love through love bombing and grooming. And he induces in her a counter reaction, which is maternal. Now, at some point, the narcissist withdraws the mother projection. He stops being a mother. And that is one of the major sources, if not the major engine of prolonged grief. Because when you lose your mother as a child, the grief is infinite and, and prolonged by definition. So what the narcissist does, the narcissist regresses you in, into an infantile state where he is your mother. He provides you with unconditional love and you become a child. And then he withdraws this love and you're an orphan. You become an orphan. The unconditional love is gone. Mother is gone. And on the very contrary, you are the mother now. The grief is enormous. I call this the dual, dual mothership system. Most people and most scholars would say that the narcissist is forcing the intimate partner to become his mother. But it's not actually about forcing. It's about a trade-off. I will be your mother if you will be my mother. Like, let's be each other's mother. I will love you unconditionally. I will tell you, I will idealize you and I will let you love yourself if you do the same for me. Everything in narcissism is mutual. The process of idealization is co-idealization. I will idealize you so that I feel ideal because I own you. So there is this dual mothership. Are these, are these your observations, Sam? Yes. Or, uh... yes, this is new. I hope um, I hope people listen to what you're saying very very carefully in the in the narcissistic abuse field because this is this is novel and this is very important and it also smashes a lot of the these these stupid established beliefs that people have within the area of narcissistic abuse the way it plays out how it plays out and when we misunderstand the mechanics it really slows the healing process down but I've listened to you over the last year and i'm I, I this is like a culmination of what i've heard building up which is that the mother issue is critical it's absolutely we have to understand this mothering role that the narcissist be they male or female becomes your mother 
and they're inviting you to become their mother. And now you're in this symbiosis of feeding each other narcissistic supply. So you, he, for, he forces the woman back into the, his womb. He becomes the mother. You're forced into the womb, the matrix. Exactly. And the matrix is the illusion. That's the womb. Yes. And then tears you back out. Yes. And you're, you're, you're orphaned at that point. Narcissist says to you, I'm going to love you as your mother should have loved you. I'm going to mm. love you unconditionally. God. I'm going to love you unconditionally because you're amazing. You're a genius. You're incredible. You're the most beautiful woman on earth. You are unprecedented. I've never seen anything like you. You are, you know, so I'm going to love you unconditionally. And I'm going to love you as a mother. Because only a mother loves unconditionally. Adult, adult love is never unconditional. Adult love is conditional. Only a mother loves unconditionally. And love bombing and grooming is unconditional love. End of story. So by definition, it's maternal love. So the narcissist says to you, I'm going to love you as a mother if you love me as a mother. So let's idealize each other, co-idealization. Let's idealize each other. I will let you see yourself through my eyes. I will let you be seen through the eyes of a mother so that you can finally love yourself and accept yourself through me, through my agency. By the way, there are religious equivalents where people say, where people say, we love, we love through the eyes of God. We love, we love ourselves as God sees us. You know, as Jesus sees you, you know, because God loves you infinitely and unconditionally. So you can love yourself infinitely and unconditionally. Because you, you can love yourself through God, you know. And so, and, 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 so the narcissist strikes this deal and but at some point he withdraws everything he withdraws access to your idealized image because he devalues you he withdraws his maternal love unconditional love and so on and then there's a grief reaction and it's a prolonged grief because what child can overcome the loss of an infinitely unconditionally loving mother People who had lost God, by the way, describe an identical grief reaction. It's like when they lost their faith. We have, for example, testimonies of people from the Holocaust who had lost their faith in God, having spent some time in Auschwitz. So they describe pro a prolonged, lifelong grief reaction that they cannot overcome because they have lost the source of love. And indeed, in the New Testament, God is identified with love. It's a love, a loving God, not the Old Testament, but the New. The New Testament God, and there's there is a there is a womb like imagery there because you live within God's grace and heaven. You go within heaven, and it's back to the womb. It's back to the to the mob, the mothership. So, if you lost access to God's grace, you were living outside of God's grace in the cold, brutal world, yeah. and outside of heaven. Then, yeah, it's the you're condemned to hell, essentially. Yeah. So Part I could see the grief. That. Part of the grief is that you don't believe it's ever going to happen to you again. Mm. Because you see, as a child, to be a child is a once in a lifetime experience. You have only one mother. You don't have six mothers or 23 mothers. You have one. It's a once in a lifetime experience. It's a use it or lose it experience. And you have the same sensation with the narcissist. You say to yourself, having lost the narcissist, this is never going to happen to me again. No one is ever going to love me again the way my narcissist loved me. This was unique. And, and the sense of loss is all permeating. It's like you, you were expelled from paradise, exactly as you said. It's in the expulsion. And, and you don't think it's ever going to happen to you again. I said four mechanisms, and I'll, I'll mention another three. <laughs> which will make it five mechanisms. <laughs> so the next thing is that the narcissist exports his grief. Now, if you watch, if some of you watched the previous video, I explained that narcissism is actually a post-traumatic condition coupled with prolonged grief. The narcissist is in a state of prolonged grief because the narcissist as a child had been denied um, many things, had been denied unconditional love, 
had been denied acceptance, had been denied the ability to become an individual, and so on. So narcissists have a grief reaction. It's, they, they mourn who they could have been and were never given the chance to be. So they're imbued with grief. And what they do, they export this grief to you. I call it grief export. So they kind of uh, dump the grief on you. This is the toxic emanation that people feel. Uh, they misidentified with abuse. Abuse is easy to withstand, by the way. Uh, proper outright abuse is easy to, to withstand. You go somewhere, someone punches you in the face, someone insults you, you know how to cope with it. And there's no lasting effect. There's no lasting effect. But what's difficult to, to is when you're immersed, when you're immersed in negative affectivity, negative emotions, such as grief, it's toxic, it's poisonous. And it's difficult to cleanse yourself. No wonder, again, in religion, we have cleansing rituals when you had come across evil, across, I don't know, in exorcism or something. You know? So but the narcissist exports grief. I think a further confounding factor is if you're being abused and somebody says, I'm slapping you because I hate you because you're a wretch, it's different than if somebody slaps you and says, I'm not slapping you, I'm educating you because I love you. There's that, there's that immersion and this is done in a motherly way. I have to do this. This is that becomes much more confusing. So yeah, I, 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 that resonates with me. Pure outright abuse. If you're pretty resilient, you'll be like, well, that's that's no. it's their problem. But if it's through love, now it's my problem. I I didn't learn the lesson. I failed the the mother in some way. Yeah, I disappointed her and so so there is an element of emotional blackmail, but mm. there's also an element of grief. The to be with a narcissist is to be imbued, to immerse yourself, to, to drown in his grief. Mm. The narcissist is dead. It's a dead entity. It's a corpse. It's an animated corpse. There's nobody there. And death permeates and, and engulfs the relationship. It's a dead relationship. Very often abuse victims will tell you the relationship was dead. And, and the narcissist exports his grief. He's trying to lay it out on you. He's trying to kind of cleanse himself by infecting you, by polluting you, by contaminating you. And, and this, I think this is another source of prolonged grief. The last thing is uh, the narcissist becomes a symbiont. Symbiont means he creates a symbiotic relationship akin to mother-child relationship. And I said, he becomes a mother. So he becomes a symbiont. Now, um, to disentangle symbiosis in, in relationship or what was came to be known later as merger and fusion. Um, this is the exact equivalent of amputation. If you amputate one of your, or have to amputate one of your organs or whatever, there will be a grief reaction. And there will be a brief, grief reaction, which is, probably prolonged and complicated and, and you know pathological because it's giving up on a part of you. So separating from the narcissist, divorcing the narcissist, disentangling the symbiosis is self-grief. It's not grieving the other person, it's grieving yourself. You are grieving yourself in, a mul in multiple ways. First of all, you are denied access to the idealized image of yourself. So you can no longer self-love. And then you lose the symbiont in a symbiosis. So you're losing part of you. So you grieve that too. And then there's a grief of a narcissist, which somehow you had convinced yourself is your own grief because somehow you're letting the narcissist down or you are hurting him or you're something. So again, it's you. It all comes back to you all the time. And then you lose your mother. The narcissist stops mothering you, but you have to continue to mother him. So there's a feeling that you are missing out on something or, or you're losing something. You're just giving and not taking and not receiving. So what the narcissist succeeds to do, he succeeds to make you mourn yourself. I think the core issue is that in typical healthy grief, we mourn losses which are external to us. 
we mm. mourn a loved one. We mourn the loss mm. of a car. And if you're Jewish, we mourn losses in the stock exchange. But <laughs> I knew you're that would get you. Yeah. You're allowed. I mean, <laughs> yeah. but I could just was... sit and laugh politely. Oh, yes. Sam, you rascal. <laughs> yes, rascal. That's the word. But in prolonged grief, I think this is self-grief. I don't believe there's any prolonged grief possible without self-grief. And I think this is the missing element in the DSM definition of prolonged grief. Because the DSM says, if you grieve anything, any loss, more than one year, that's pathological. But I think what they're missing is, it's not possible to grieve anything for longer than one year if you are not at the same time grieving a part of yourself, grieving yourself. And this is the power of the narcissist. He makes you mourn yourself because you are no longer. You have been hijacked, then transformed. You have been made to love an image which is not you. You have been made to be mothered by, a non, by an unreal mother. Things happen to you which are surrealistic. And so you're mourning a part of you that had never been true. And there's no end to it. So that, I'm, I might have got this wrong, but maybe then if I lose something and it's external and I can grieve for it healthily, no matter how wonderful it was, the relationship, the person, the job, whatever it was, it wasn't me and that's mm -hmm. acceptable. But mm -hmm. if it's me, it's yeah. unacceptable. I yeah. can't accept the loss yes. of this part yes. of myself. Yes. If you terminate the grief, you admit that you are no more. Oh, think about it. If I lose a loved one, an external loved one with whom I've yes. had a healthy relationship, not that I know what that is, but anyhow, <laughs> with whom I've had a healthy relationship, I've lost a loved one. It hurts. I cry. I'm sad. Right. But at some point, I accept that he is or she is no more. But if I've lost myself, if I stop the morning, I accept that I am no more. It would, it's, it would require Zen levels of enlightenment. I mean, I don't, well, I just don't know how you would do that. Because you would cease to be the person who is grieving. Yes. It's a self-defeating self process. Right. You can't stop grieving. As long as you're grieving and mourning, there is someone who is doing the grieving and mourning. The so minute you stop grieving and mourning, it means you had accepted your loss, that you are lost, that you are gone, that you are no more. That's the power a, of narcissistic abuse. So the narcissist puts you into an existential double bind yes. that you can never... Yes, extricate yourself from. True. can never extricate yourself from. I think this is the missing link in the DSM definition. Okay. The DSM should have stated that all prolonged grief includes a strong element, if not a dominant element, of grieving oneself. So that grief is interminable because the minute you stop grieving, you had accepted the loss and the loss is you. So the minute you stop grieving, you had accepted that you are no more. Wait, I mean, these are, these are things that are done by um, the DSM definitions. There's usually somebody in charge and then like, a little council or a collective of six to 20 people, maybe we can reach out to them, just send an email and say, Hey, did you guys think about that? Cause they, they sort of vote on it democratically, don't they? They work it out yeah, together and say, we think as a group, there's a committee, they have a committee. thank you committee. Maybe they can be reached and just said, you know, perhaps consider, perhaps consider adding this. Yeah. It might be a good idea, but I yeah. honestly, I honestly think my grandiosity aside, I honestly mm. think that, Prolonged grief must include an element of self-grief. Yes. Must. There's no other uh, explanation. You're, yeah. Well, you're, the, the, the definition you just gave, it makes perfect sense. Why, why would we uh, not be able to? Because if I've lost um, sort of object relations theory, if I've lost an object, and that, an object relations theory and psychoanalytic theory for people who don't know, that would include a person. At an infantile level, these are ex I am subject. It is object car person it's object i'm still me i'm still here yeah. however awful it was i am still here but if mm. i am not that is a major effing problem if i yes. have ceased to be 
what is to end the grief? Mm. When you end the grief, mm. you accept the loss. You said, that's it, it's gone. It's no more. But how can you accept the loss of you? How can you say, I am no more? <laughs> yeah. What the narcissist does, he, he creates an ambience, an environment, a fantasy. I call it the Hall of Mirrors. He creates a, a shared fantasy. That's Sanders term, not mine. Mm. He creates a shared fantasy where you fall in love with yourself through him, through him. You see your idealized image. You fall in love with your idealized image. So when you talk to victims, they say, I love the way he loved me. I just love the way he loved me. They fall in love with themselves through his eyes. And then he becomes your mother and gives you unconditional love. So it's again about you. It's not about him. It's about you at the beginning. The love bombing and grooming phase. The narcissist gives. He doesn't take. He just gives. And he gives us a great simulation of a mother. So again, it's about you. And then he becomes a symbiont. You, it creates a symbiosis. And again, it's about you. Because in a symbiosis, you get nourishment from the symbiosis. So the narcissist creates an environment which is all, that's the irony because people are totally getting it wrong. They think the narcissist creates an environment that's about him. No, the power of the narcissist is that he creates an environment that's 100% about you, not about him. He enslaves it's you by rendering you a narcissist, actually. I, I really hope people can hear you. I really, really hope that they can because it's one again one of these major misunderstandings um, within this area. The, there are givens now because there's so much content about narcissistic abuse, and they operate on these implicit. It's like an ideology; these implicit yes. givens within the CPTSD model. The narcissist is a fight fawn responder. Everybody wants to focus on the fight, the bullying, the aggression. They dominate. You've missed the fawn. You've missed. They give, they submit, they supplicate, they flatter. That's far more dangerous because, yeah. as, as you've just said, it plugs us back into our own innate latent narcissism and then it accelerates it, explodes it, expands on it. We become quite sick in the end. Let's, let's all re remind ourselves of a fact. Mm. Narcissism is a childhood artifact. Mm. If I regress you to infancy, you automatically becomes, become a narcissist. End of story. There's no child who is not a narcissist. Mm. So if the narcissist becomes your mother, if he gives you unconditional love, if he makes you fall in love with an idealized image as a mother does, he reg he's regressing you to childhood. He's infantilizing you. He's creating a dependence on you, in you automatically, unwillingly, you become a narcissist because children are narcissistic. Freud and Jung and many, many others afterwards, all the way down to Bowlby and others, they all described, they all said that narcissism is by far the most critical psychodynamic feature of childhood. They had disagreements, they had disagreements. For example, Jung said that narcissism is, is healthy in all its forms, by the way. Jung did not recognize that there is pathological narcissism. It's healthy and it's part of introversion. Freud said, well, narcissism is healthy, but if it continues, in, continues into adulthood, it's pathological. But there's no debate, not even among modern psychologists, people who mock and deride Jung and Freud. There's no debate anywhere that narcissism is a critical feature of childhood. So if I make you a prisoner of war, if I put you in, in a civilian prison or in a boot camp, I regress you. I regress you. If you become a patient, if you, if you get ill and you're in a hospital, in all these situations, you become dependent. The minute you're dependent, your, your locus of control is externalized. At that moment, you automatically become a narcissist. Willy-nilly, you can't help it. End of story. The narcissist does this to you. 
he pushes you back, he regresses you to infancy. In, 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 in nice ways, he makes you fall in love with yourself as a mother would. He becomes your mother for a while during the grooming and love bombing. So you become a child. You allow yourself to become a child. It's an oceanic feeling. It's a wonderful feeling. People, all people, even victims describe that the relationship with the narcissist is unique. It's amazing. It's technicolor. It's unprecedented. They've never had this before or after. Why? Because they, they were allowed to revisit their childhood. They were allowed to become children again. And when the victims became children at the beginning of the relationship, they became narcissists. Whether they like it or don't like it, it's politically correct or not. The minute you're pushed to become a child, you also become a narcissist. So the narcissist infects you. That's why I keep saying narcissism is contagious. I'm, I'm laughing with glee at the uh, the horrified and outraged comments that will appear under this video from the empaths, from the people who want to believe in this dichotomaniacal view that like it's angels and demons, good and I can't be bad because I am good. <laughs> narcissism is narcissism started as a clinical entity and ended now as a morality play. Right, morality play, good against evil, mm -hmm. um, kind of you know manichaean manichaean battle of mm -hmm. the. It's stupid. It's stupid because this is a splitting defense. If you say, I'm all good and the narcissist is all bad, that's a narcissistic defense. <laughs> that's prime narcissistic behavior. That's yeah. what narcissists do. They split. That's what borderlines do. They split. Splitting is a primitive defense mechanism, very typical of grandiose narcissistic structures. Yeah. So ironically, the very victims and empaths and super galactic uh, hypernova, whatever, these people are splitting all the time. And so they are, by clinical definition, being narcissistic. They're acting as narcissists do. So there is, a, when I say that the narcissist is a symbiont in a symbiosis, there is, um, there is a huge background to this. There's a huge literature on symbiosis and so on and so forth. And I did I did prepare like I did prepare myself with quotes from the literature and, and so on uh, for two reasons. If we discuss symbiosis, it, some things will become more comprehensible. And the second reason is I love to hear my voice. And so you know the longer I speak, um, the longer I'm gratified, and it's all about the more gratifying, gratifying it is. <laughs> it's all about gratifying me. I mean, <laughs> so, but there's no need. I mean, there's no strict need to go into this. I could just refer people to work done on symbiosis. Now, we don't, we no longer use the word symbiosis, we use the word merger fusion. Hmm. But symbiosis has been, had been studied in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And people who really want to go into it, they can read the writings of Mahler, Masterson, uh, Parnes. So there are scholars who, who studied it. And it's pretty stunning, don't, don't misunderstand. I mean, it's an amazing, amazing thing. And um, the narcissist triggers all this, all this cascade of processes which are entombed in childhood. Like after childhood, you put it in a, in a vault and you never touch it again. The narcissist opens a vault and activates the symbiosis. And it's pretty amazing stuff, you know. But so, so it's, even, it's also relevant to codependency. Yes, sorry, go ahead. So even if the person wasn't raised in, in um, so excuse me, adverse childhood conditions, and they didn't, they don't particularly have codependency or CPTSD, the narcissist is, is still gonna induce in you these primitive, functions these infantile functions and render you more narcissistic whether you had a problem before or you didn't you will develop cptsd you will develop codependency because of um this infantilizing process that forces you into symbiosis that what you're saying is you're naturally primed for you shouldn't engage yeah. in this in an adult to adult relationship but you will if it's offered to you yeah something like that no one yes you're right Everyone goes through a symbiotic phase, mm. uh, which lasts 
in healthy conditions last until age 18 months. Everyone goes through a symbiotic phase. Healthy people or relatively healthy people, they end the symbiotic phase with a process called separation individuation. They separate from mummy and they become individuals. With the narcissist, this process is disrupted. With codependence, this process is disrupted, borderlines. I mean, in some mental health disorders, this process is disrupted. And then the narcissist or the borderline or the codependent, they remain fused with the mother. They carry mother with them wherever they go. It's like, like um, an, an alien inside them. And they can't get rid of it. They are possessed, in, if you want to use religious terminology. So this fused it's called fused self-state or fused self-object, fused self-object. The fused self-object simply means that you are not fully yourself, that there's a substantial element of you that is mother and that you carry it for life. Now, these are the easy targets of the narcissist because it can trigger the symbiosis like this. Anyhow, it's triggered, anyhow, it's active, even in adult life. But you're right, even if you're perfectly healthy, and the symbiosis ended, and you separated, and you individuated, and you name it. The narcissist knows to unlock your symbiosis. And he unlocks your symbiosis by, by offering you an irresistible drug, unconditional love. No one can resist this. No one alive or dead can resist this. Unconditional love is the nectar and the drug and the of of life itself. It is through the mother's unconditional love that we begin to realize that we are separate and we create boundaries and we create the self. It is through the mother, mother's unconditional love that we experience safety, a safe base. It is through her unconditional love that we feel empowered enough to take on the world because we know she, he, she has our back. You know, she loves us. We can always go back to her. It is through her unconditional love that we develop the grandiosity that is required to explore the world as a two-year-old. And later, the grandiosity to explore other people in object relations, for example, in adolescence, which is the second phase of narcissism. Mother's unconditional love is the end all and be all. You did not receive unconditional love. You are effed for life for life. Here comes the narcissist and he's offering you a second chance, a second dose. He's a drug dealer. He's a drug dealer. And he's offering a drug that no man alive, the man was not born yet, who can resist. So you're right, healthy people will fall for it. And the unconditional love unlocks the symbiosis. Because you receive unconditional love only in the symbiotic phase. So the minute you receive it, it triggers symbiosis. You, you are catapulted back like a rocket, you know, zoom. You're catapulted back to age 18 months. And here's mother in the form of the narcissist. And he offers you this acceptance and admiration and adoration and idealization and so on. And you sink deeper and deeper because you're a baby. You're becoming the infantilization process is never stopped. You regress up to probably three months, according to some studies. So it's a seriously dangerous process. Why? Because when it stops, when it stops, you're three months old. You don't have the capacity to separate from the narcissist anymore. You are in a symbiosis called shared fantasy. So you can't separate anymore. You can't grieve even. I mean, you can't grieve effectively because if you give up, you are giving up on yourself because you are the narcissist. You and the narcissist are one. It's called fused self-object. You're one object. If you give up on the narcissist, for example, you broke up with the narcissist. You give up on him, you automatically give up on yourself. So this, this would be why for the coaches and the psychologists and the counselors, when you're trying to help somebody recover from narcissistic abuse, at some point you end up wrestling with them over their unwillingness to put the narcissist down. They won't put it down. 
They can't. And, um, they are the they, they can't because they're fused. And what yes. what we might not realize is we're asking them effectively to put themselves down, to let yes. go of themselves at that yes. point. How would you help somebody recover from that phase? The only way, the only way is to go again through separation individuation. So okay. there's a need, there's a need in therapy, for example, to simply replay the whole process of symbiosis and then separation individuation and then um, constellated self-object, that means sexual object that is I, not I, and so on. But initially when the patient presents herself, she is the narcissist. She carries the narcissist with her the same way the narcissist carries his mother with him. They are fused self-object. When you're telling her, give up on him, forget him, delete him, lose him, you're telling her, give up on yourself, kill yourself, delete yourself, etc., etc. Now there's a law, there's a rule in, in psychology, which is borrowed from the Old Testament. It's called the Talion rule. Talion, T-A-L-I-O-N, Talion rule. It's a pretty amazing rule. It means that, that you will always create a mirror image of an emotion. So for example, if you hate other people, you will end up hating yourself. If you want to kill someone, if you hate someone, if you are enraged someone, you will end up having suicidal ideation. There is a kind of reaction and action and reaction, Newtonian action and reaction. And that's called the Italian law in, in psychology. It's a pretty bizarre coming to think of it, thing, but it's well documented. So for example, if you want to kill metaphorically the narcissist, you end up wanting to kill yourself. So the narcissist kind of capitalizes on this. He, he, he knows that you can't afford to go all the way because if you will go all the way, if you will try to hurt the symbiont, if you will try to hurt him, you will end up hurting yourself. Now people develop, develop OCD, they develop rituals to defend against the Italian law. So they hate the narcissist, they want the narcissist dead, metaphorically at least, but that creates a backlash through the Italian law and they feel they want to kill themselves. They feel they want to die. When you talk to many victims, they tell you, I want to die. It's so bad, I want to die. Actually, that's Italian law in action. They don't want to die. They hate the narcissist, they want him dead, but they feel they want to die. And so they develop rituals, protective rituals against this. They become highly obsessive compulsive. Wait a minute. If you take grief and you couple it with obsession compulsion, what do you get? You get prolonged grief. Prolonged grief is compulsive grief. Yeah, but the, okay, but the way that you're presenting it now, and I haven't seen the DSM definition, is prolonged grief then is actually uh, a survival mechanism. I'm deliberately engaging in prolonged grief and these obsessive compulsive rituals to avoid the truth of the scenario just so I can earn one more day. On, on Yes, because to stop the grief, earth. to stop the grief, <laughs> To stop yeah. the morning is suicide. <laughs> so I'm, I'm laughing, but it's horrifying. It's like a description from a horror movie. I attack the demon and as I sink the axe yeah. in it, it actually creates a wound in me at the same time yes. because we are we've become one with the monster. Yes, precisely. Mm. If you if you end the grief, you end yourself. Mm. And this is through the Italian law. The the extent of negative emotions you have towards the narcissist extent of negative emotions the Nazis have provoked in you through abandonment and through, actually backfires on you. So you become suicidal. And to fend off against the suicide, against the imminent blooming, dooming suicide, what you do, you develop obsessive compulsive rituals. What is this ritual? It's another name for prolonged grief. What I'm suggesting is that prolonged grief is an obsessive compulsive ritual. It's a ritualistic defense against suicidal impulses, which are generated through the Italian law. Uh, to be clear, this, this Talionic law, uh, it's referenced in the Bible, isn't it? Yes, eye true. for an eye, eye, for an eye. tooth yes. for a tooth. Yes, true. 
so the people who are obsessively compulsively posting on forums, watching YouTube videos around narcissism and not moving on with their lives by this model, what they're doing is they're engaging in an obsessive compulsive cyclical behavior and they're because they're trapped in prolonged grief. And if they stop doing this, they will feel that they've stopped themselves. It's an, yes, it's an they existential feel, they feel they're, they're dying. Yeah, it's, it's to exist. It's, yeah, it's survival. The, the drug it's a catechism. Dealer... It's a catechism for those of you who are Catholic. It's catechism. Right, it's a catechism. Yeah. yeah. So so you become impure, purified, impure, yes. purified. Yes. And there's no escape because no. tomorrow you'll become impure again. You'll yes. just receive, you're a vessel for this. For the, the drug dealer analogy before, um, I was thinking of uh, The Matrix again. For those of you who don't know, Matrix means womb. So the, the, the film The Matrix is actually about the pods that people are forced into. The narcissist's drug dealer is offering people the blue pill and saying, go back to sleep, enter the pod, enter the Matrix. We'll plug you in. You're now symbiotic with the, this huge machine. We'll steal your energy, which is narcissistic supply, but we'll feed you a beautiful illusory life of who you could be and it's fundamentally narcissistic you trade your your life blood your life energy for narcissistic supply and narcissistic delusion it's a real horror story stuff this it is and it's not an accident that people talk about vampires demons i mean people have gone nuts I mean, you go, you go to board, you go to forums that deal with bipolar disorder, or I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no one uses these terms there. No one. When, when you go to to other mental health forums that deal with other mental health issues, you don't. No one. No one uses metaphors like or similes like vampires and you know. But mm -hmm. in narcissistic abuse forums, this is very common. Yeah. People have to resort. To religion, mythology, I mean, they, the sci-fi. They run out of run out of imagery to, yeah. <laughs> and they are right. They're not lying or exaggerating. The experience is surrealistic in the fullest sense of the word. It's dreamlike, nightmare, because it's a shared fantasy. It's a fantasy scape, a paracosm. You know. When I was listening to your video on this. Um... And I recommend it again, the, the Sam's video, Narcissist's Grieving Infant. You said that the person who'd experienced the narcissistic abuse and then was trapped in the prolonged grief cycle, one of the things that happened was their superego becomes engaged and they shame themselves and guilt themselves for the grief that they're trapped inside of. Um, that resonated with me very, very deeply in my experience. Of, I was thinking of you when I said it. No, yeah, well, and it, it <laughs> struck home, Sam. It worked. <laughs> I'm kidding. Why, okay. why, do you think, why do you think that that happens, that the person who's receiving the abuse then goes through this sense of, of guilt and shame and this, uh, this highly activated uh, toxic superego? Because there are only two strategies to exit the symbiosis. One is separation. And one is to merge. These are your two options. Either you run away or you want run towards. If you merge and fuse with the narcissist, it means you cease to exist. Right? If you merge and fuse, you're no, you're no more. If you separate from the narcissist, it also feels like you cease to exist. Because you then lose the maternal, maternal uh, gaze. And so not being seen is, as a child, as a three months old, not being seen is not being. So both separation, which is perceived as, as amputation, both separation and, and merger are the exact emotional equivalents of death. Mm. And in both, in, in the first case, the case of separation, there's a lot of guilt. The victims ironically perceive themselves as abandoning the narcissist. Mm -hmm. If you talk to many victims, they will tell you they felt highly uncomfortable to walk away. They felt, many of them will tell you they felt like they were abandoning a child yeah. they, or a parent figure. So separation is perceived as betrayal and it creates enormous shame and guilt. But the alternative merger infusion or symbiosis as it used to be called also creates uh, negative emotions because it requires self-sacrifice, self-immolation. 
And so it requires self-betrayal. And when we betray ourselves, we develop depression. We, we don't feel good with it. We, so also there, there's a lot of shame. Having betrayed yourself, you have degraded yourself. You have disrespected yourself. Mm. It's shameful to betray yourself, you know? In other words, Masterson in 1972, I think, wrote that a, relation, a symbiotic relationship in adulthood is a real rendezvous with death. Those are his words. So what happens is when you separate, you are left only with bad introjects. You are left only with bad internal objects. Either you had betrayed others or you had betrayed yourself. In any case, you are Judas Iscariot. In any case, you are a traitor, mm. one way or another. You can't emerge from this smelling like a rose. Mm. It's, uh, so this is the source of the shame and the, and the guilt. By the way, narcissist, excuse me for one second, but narcissist goes exactly through the same process with his mother. Narcissism is grounded in shame. It's a reaction to shame. That's why we call it compensatory. It's mm -hmm. narcissism, Masterson observed that it's, the child is shamed by the parent. And so there's this enormous all pervasive shame and narcissism is, says, I'm not ashamed. Narcissism is a grandiose reaction. I'm not ashamed, I'm not guilty, I'm superhuman, I'm done this and that. A child's reaction. So then it, when helping uh, clients or helping ourselves, <laughs> in my case, to uh, walk away from narcissistic abusive relationships, we should be saying, steal yourself for the shame that will come. It will come. It's not authentic. It's part of the shared fantasy. It's a, it's a hangover from this fusion merger symbiosis you've gone through. You are going to feel like a traitor. You'll feel like you've left a child behind. But that isn't real. That's part of the delusion. You just have to go through this. You're making a great point. And we made it in our previous conversation. Narcissism creates emotional artifacts. Mm. Now, those of you who have medical education in, in medical imaging, we have many outcomes on, on the images that are not real. They're shadows and echoes and they're not real, but they're easily interpreted as, as disease processes. They're easily interpreted wrongly. And we call them artifacts, imaging artifacts. The narcissist creates emotional artifacts. Your shame is not real. Your guilt is not real because you're, you're, sh you're ashamed and you feel guilty for something that had never existed. The paracosm is not real. This fantasy was not real. Your idealized image was not real. The mother figure which the narcissist had enacted for you was not real. His unconditional love was not real. Your reaction to his unconditional love was not real. In short, nothing was real. I think this is what is killing the victims. The realization suddenly that nothing, but I mean nothing was real. I can't find a single element in, in relationships with narcissists that, had, that was real. Not one, not the cognitions, not the emotions, not the effects, not the behaviors, not the traits, not the perceptions, not the information, nothing is real. Nothing is real. And um, there is optimism there because what you would say to the clients is, look, I'm gonna tell you something that hurts you and it, but the extent to which it hurts you is also the extent to which it frees you. They never loved you. You were never in love. It was not real. That hurts. But the guilt and the shame that you walking that you feel from walking away from this, that is also not real. So that frees you. It's painful, but it but it is it is freeing at the same time. The problem with this is that you're talking to an adult. Mm. What you've just communicated, you trying trying to communicate with an adult. It's not an adult. It's in the worst case, three months old. There are cases like this. And in the best case, 18 months. The re regression is catastrophic. The symbiosis is total. The immersion is, immersion is complete. Extracting from that requires a process of growing up before you can have the dialogue that you have just suggested. This message will not be absorbed. It will be, no. it will be rejected in a variety of ways. For example, it could be rejected passive aggressively. Uh, the, the patient can say, yeah, you're right. It wasn't real, fuck him, you know, this, that. Mm. But then 
go on and continue to act as though it were real. For example, continue to attack the narcissist for not loving her or for abandoning her or for betraying her. Narcissists never betray. You can't betray something that's not real. Narcissists never lie to you. They never gaslight you. They never do anything to you because it's all a video game. Right. Imagine complaining about a video game and saying, this guy just shot me. It's horrible. I, you know, it's a game. And by the way, internally, how narcissists perceive it, they perceive it as a game. I, I mean, they have this perception that it's a game, a movie, kind of movie. And so they walk away unscathed and un, unperturbed because game over, you know? So when you talk to a child, these messages, which are absolutely capture the essence, but they are wasted unless and until the child has an opportunity to become an adult again, ex exit the symbiosis. Now, exiting the symbiosis is not about telling the patient it was not real, now exit. <laughs> it's about breaking the self-object. Now that the patient is fused, you need to break the self-object. And the only way to break the self-object is to force separation and individuation. And the only way to do this is to practically separate. So to establish a rigid regime of, for example, not mentioning the narcissist for one month, um, walking away physically. So if, if you live in the same apartment, separating. If you live in the same city, relocating. If you work in the same company, resigning. There need to be visible signs of separation. The separation needs to be real, physical, geographical. Symbolically, when you act, this is translated in the mind to separation. That's the first step. And so the self-object breaks, the fusion breaks. And this is the first step. And then the second step is individuation because the victim had lost her individuality. She became merged. Having separated from the narcissist in every conceivable way, absolutely physically and geographically, mentally, socially, in every way, having separated for a minimal period of time, it's like detox. Having done this, she now is ready to become an individual, which in itself is another process, but we have techniques for that, developed since the time of Kohut to individuate a patient. Once individuation is complete, then your message comes into play. Now you're faced with an adult, adult who is separated, adult who recognizes her individuality, an adult who is no longer symbiotic with the narcissist. And so now you can tell her everything that you've gone through was a simulation, it was a simulated scenario. There's a game. You, you, you were rendered a character in a video game. Don't, you don't need to take it personally or as anything real. So you can't have real emotions. Whatever you are feeling, these are simulated emotions. These are artifacts. So this message is not wasted on an adult, but it's totally wasted on a child. I, I heard what you said. I hope the people who are watching this can hear it. Would, would you be willing maybe to do an, an interview just on individuation, just on helping people get to that point where they can receive those adult to adult messages? Yeah, you see, these people used to be adults. So the, there's hope. They have this experience. It's like, you know, you never forget to, to drive and never forget to have sex, I think. So <laughs> I don't have a driving license and let us not talk about the other example. <laughs> so no, seriously, it's like never forgetting something, you know? Mm. So I tend to compare this to an accident where you had become quadriplegic, a really serious accident. You know, vertebrae is here, are shattered, you suddenly lose your body completely. There, there's physiotherapy. Physiotherapy can restore motion to some of your organs, gradually maybe, restore you completely. This is individuation. You had this skill, you used to do it before, you used to do adult before. But the Nazis took it away from you, disabled that part inactivated it, you need to reactivate. 
You can't do this if you're not separate from the narcissist. In your mind and in your body, you need to be aware. Also in your mind, for example, you need to not mention the narcissist ever in any context, directly or indirectly for 30 days. You need to not think of the narcissist. If you happen to think of a narcissist, you need to punish yourself somehow. I'm not kidding. You need to go out and give $100 to someone. To the, next, to the nearest beggar, it's a punishment. Trust me, it will reduce the, the number of times you think about the narcissist, especially if you're Jewish. So <laughs> that's a Jewish therapy. So <laughs> no, but I'm serious. You understand what I'm saying? You need to give reinforcements. Yeah. You need to give yeah. negative and positive reinforcements to structure a regime yeah. that will help you to separate. Once you're separated, we can dedicate another program to individuation therapies which were developed originally by Franz Kobold and, and others, by Heinz Kohn and, and others. So um, there's individuation therapies. Once you are separated and individuated, technically you're an adult. Technically you're an adult. And then there are the messages about the fact that what you had experienced was a simulation, was not real. And what you're, what you're feeling, your emotions right now, and your cognitions, by the way, many of your cognitions are not real. They're not yours. They're real. They're not yours. Yeah. They're not and yours. For, for people who want to know more about that, please go to Sam's channel and watch the conversation that me and Sam had that was about uh, emotional artifacts, entrainment. You're absorbing the narcissists, their thought yeah. processes, even their emotions and and all of that. I'm, I'm aware of uh, the time, Sam. Um, is there anything else that, that that you'd like to add to help people to, to really get a... A, a good practical grasp of, of the subject of, of prolonged grief? The relationships with narcissists are, are not the only case where we enter a simulated zone. Mm. They're not the only case where we confuse simulation with reality, and they're definitely not the only case where we resonate. There's a resonance, emotional and cognitive resonance, with an outside source that the resonance is so powerful that we tend to misattribute it to ourselves. And this is called attribution error or attribution bias. So it's not the only case. For example, if you go to a political rally, if you, if you watch online a Nazi political rally in Nuremberg, you see this in action. It's a simulated zone, but people become one. There are studies of crowd psychology, uh, rock concerts, in a rock concert, in a good rock concert. I mean, there, there are many situations like this where actually I would say majority of, of our, ex, the, the vast majority of our experiences, they're like that because we are storytellers. We inhabit imaginary spaces. We are made of dreams. We are the only organism that sacrifices his life for fiction. Not for anything real, not for food, not for, a, not for a female, for fiction. Utter fiction. For example, a nation, which is fictitious concoction. There's no such thing. No such thing, by the way, biologically even. Yeah. But we do it. So don't be too hard on yourself. It's what the narcissist does is a great spinner of yarns, is a great storyteller. And his advantage, he is the story. So it's easy for, for him to believe in his own story. He doesn't feel that he's conning you or deceiving you. He believes that he's offering you access to a privileged universe of magic, enchantment, and charm. He invites you in, and he thinks you should be very grateful for it. Because it's once in a lifetime experience. It's the mother of all Disneylands, you know? And it's stunning, it's transcendental, it's almost supernatural in his mind. And here you are, the one and only chosen, you're chosen. It's an irresistible, irresistible temptation to be chosen. And here you are, you're the chosen one. And so if you spend six months with the narcissist and then he dumps you, you still should be grateful because you've just had the six months of your life. And because another 8 billion people didn't have this blessing, didn't have this chance. 
the narcissist creates perfect simulated environments replete with cognitions, emotions, behaviors, traits, expectations, narratives, lore, and so on. We have a name for that. It's called a cult. It's a cult. Yeah. Many people fall prey to cults. So when we discuss individuation, so we can also discuss deprogramming tools. Because yes, that would be useful. there's a lot of literature and practice on how to deprogram cult members. Cults are simulated spaces where there's a narrative that is extremely little to do with reality. And cults engender in their members emotional and cognitive artifacts. Members resonate with each other. Let me tell you a recent discovery. And with this, if you wish, we will end, which will make me sad no end. I am dumping my grief on you. <laughs> okay, let me tell you a recent discovery. It was just discovered a week ago. When you date a, a, um, a counterpart, if you're heterosexual, when you date a woman, and you click, your hearts synchronize. Your hearts synchronize totally. Even if naturally you have a rapid heartbeat, tachycardia, and she has a very slow heartbeat, baricardia, your hearts start to beat to the same rhythm. They synchronize. Not only that, your skin conductance synchronizes. Despite the fact that skin conductance between men, men and women is very different. And yet it synchronizes. And finally, the amount of sweat secreted by your body is synchronized. The minute you click, within split second, your bodies become one. That's a fact. Incredible. That's a fact. We human beings, I mean, we like to think of, uh, of ourselves as individuals, individuals, atoms, totally self-sufficient, totally unrelated, totally in control, totally. That is the mother of all nonsense in psychology. And I blame psychology for this nonsensical 100%. concept. 100%. We are colonies. We are ants. We are bees. We are absolute colonies. We resonate like colonies. We work together as colonies. We synchronize biological factors and performance as colonies. We affect each other up to 100 meters by emitting molecules. They're called HEPA molecules. We, this is the minute you meet another person, you become one. The narcissist knows this, takes advantage of it um, reflexively, not cunningly, you know, just takes advantage of it as a predator and then synchronizes not only your bodies, but synchronizes the minds, melds. It's a mind meld. It's a hive mind. You become one colony with the narcissist. And so don't feel bad about it. It's a very common human experience. And the only thing is the narcissist offers you the only kind of simulation that you will are never, never able to resist. The narcissist offers you self-love. That's it. As ever, Sam, you've given me uh, a lot to think about and um, I don't really care whether the audience enjoyed it or not because <laughs> I there's an audience I, what do you mean there's an audience <laughs> narcissistically I enjoyed it no there's uh really I think some of the things that you've said here I'm gonna I'm gonna pull some of the clips out because if people can hear it it, it will really accelerate the field forward because we, we, we need the right coordinates to heal. We need to know what it is we're healing from. And I think there's a tremendous amount of misdiagnosing of the, the structure of the process of how people get stuck uh, in narcissistically abusive relationships and why the healing procedure is, is so complicated. And now we have some answers. We have some, some ways forward. So thank you uh, sincerely for that. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, really. I mean it. And you're pretty, you're pretty brave for doing what you're doing. No, honestly, because uh, these messages are not popular. No, and we are being both of us are being pen penalized by the audience and by YouTube, very frequently. Yes, yes that's true. Uh, we are both shadow banned. For those of you who don't know, both of us are shadow banned. 
uh, in the sense that we are de-ranked. We are not recommended as often and so on as we used to, and I think as we should be. So there is punishment for exiting the consensus and for not parroting the party line and not repeating rigid formulas that have very little to do with reality. So it's punishment for that. And you, I think, consciously and willingly have undertaken this punishment. That's a good definition of courage. So I commend you for this. Uh, Thank you. And this time, honestly. <laughs> Thank, you, Thank you. Jokes aside. Thank you, Sam, for joining us. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for your time and for your attention. And uh, we'll have Sam back on again very soon to discuss individuation, which I'm looking forward to. I'm sure you are as well. And uh, we look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank the you. reason I'm not in Belgrade is I can't compete with you. I mean, what girl, <laughs> what girl would want me when you are there? I'm waiting for you to leave. Leave already. Let me get there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Sam. Speak to you soon. Cheers, mate. Bye. Take care there. Bye. Safe trips. Cheers. All right.